Hello folks, this is Gary Garrett, and this is the first video in a series of how to further explore designing, drawing, and painting forests in different tree types. Future videos will cover much more about uh, different tree shapes and such, but let's introduce you to the reference that I'm going to use for this painting. I chose two different subjects for this painting, a eucalyptus tree on the left and a rounded pine tree on the right. Couple things to keep in mind as we go through this. Number one, I sped the camera up about three times its normal rate just to be able to walk you through the drawing process more. Plus the uh, lines that I'll be using in drawing will be a little bit darker than usual just so you'll be able to see the design process as I change uh, the composition to fit the frame and uh, block out the general structure of the tree. When you look at the diagram in the lower left, you see it's a very dense tree. It's sort of even almost chaotic. And I have to change that for the design of my drawing so as I paint it I'll be able to turn them more into blocks and then light those blocks uh, to make them make a lot more sense in the relationship to the whole composition. So I have a tendency to uh, knock the tree into large, medium, and small uh, different shape design here. Uh, trying to make the shapes interesting, so I'm counter, uh, watch symmetricality which I have a little bit of it already in here. But in general, I'm keeping the shapes flat so I can understand them because I know that later on in the process, I'm going to be lighting them and turning them into like cubes or blocks, which ultimately will make them easier to paint. When I hold the pencils up, you see I have a bad case of symmetricality that I'm not going to panic and change it right away, but I'll change it as I paint. That way I can keep the painting process more fluid and uh, build the design up rather than uh, worrying about every little futzy detail. As I move on to this eucalyptus tree, you'll see that there's a lot of little patches and clumps of foliage there, and I have to unify it to make sure the tree makes sense. I'm also making it a little bit shorter to fit into the composition. All these details are going to drive you crazy, but your main job is to make sure that the ultimate design is fluid and it works with the whole composition. As we move back into the pine tree, you'll notice I'll take the uh, larger pieces and break them down a little bit more and even construct some sky holes through the tree so you can see the sky dome in the background. Okay, so now I'm going to pick up a one inch brush, mix a little white and a little bit of cobalt blue together and start painting the sky in. Now it's going to be lighter and you notice I'm going over the trees a lot. I'm not even paying much attention to the outside contour of that line I put in because I know ultimately what I'm going to be doing is the tree is going to be darker and it'll be going right over the top of that. Plus again, I want to hit those sky holes in the background and not make it so much like a coloring book where I'm just filling in the pieces. I want to sort of overlap everything to increase the uh, depth of the painting ultimately. Same thing goes for the ground cover I'm about to put in. Mixed up a little bit of uh, yellow ochre and a little bit of green, kind of put them together. Tiny bit of orange which is a nice little complement. And again going right over the top of most of it because I know that even though I paint this very watercolory, that I'm using gouache and the opaqueness of the color and the material is going to be able to go over the top of that in the future in the painting. It's late spring here in Southern California so the grass is starting to turn a little bit more browner so I'm using a mixture of orange, uh, yellow ochre, greens and using a lot of wet on wet techniques. Though I'm painting this in my studio I am really trying to keep the spirit of the plain air painting alive here. When I try to mask the forms here I do when I'm using the brush try to paint the foliage going in different directions even though it's one large uh, block of color. I'm painting that bright crown of the tree on the top first and then I'll be adding slightly more shadowed colors back underneath it. Nothing drastic. You can see a lot of it's wet on wet and kind of mixed together. Again this just gives me sort of the rhythm of the shadow patterns that I can follow later on in the painting. If you look at the reference photo, you'll notice there are some, definitely some dark areas in that tree, but I don't want to get seduced by those too quick and get lost in those. My job is to get the design working first and worry about the texture and the lighting afterwards. So right now it's about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and the light's streaming in from the low right hand side of the composition. And as it does, you get the orange mixed in with the green uh, that I'm putting on there where the light is again starting to uh, fuse into that foliage that's on top of it. At this point I'm going to bring my palette into it and show you some color mixing. I'm moving over into that uh, eucalyptus tree and the color differentiation is that it's a lot more on the reddish side. So I'm taking the reds and the oranges and mixing with the greens. Again that's complementary colors so it's graying out a little bit. Still uh, pretty saturated 
but I want to make sure that the uh, the palette, as you can see, I'm mixing. I don't spread the colors out all over the place because I pretty much just keep them local and take those little pools because I'm still predominantly mixing wet under wet, so they kind of run into one another. Uh, but I'm still trying to keep the shape design there. Uh, knowing that, again, my first job is to kind of organize the underpainting before I go in with the textures over the top of it. Now moving into the shadowed areas and taking that Windsor Green, mixing it with a little bit of flame red, a little bit of Lindsum Crimson, so I get a darker color, but I'm not using black. And on the further part where I'm getting now dry brushing a little bit, I'm using a rougher paper, is I mix the Ultramarine Blue in with the uh, Windsor Green again just to get that and then mix that back into the main grouping so again tying the colors together kind of coming up with that nice neutral kind of uh, brownish color uh, for the drier foliage i'm using a fan brush to lay it out at this part and you also might notice that i have the more high contrast colors and light to the right hand side where the light's a little bit more uh, important to it and using that acrylic a uh, fan brush with the individual th thicker bristles to uh, get a little bit more of that individual texture. And I know I'm going to come back in here and cut some more sky holes into it. So I'm being really careful about, as you can see there, really careful about making sure the sky shows through. Moving on to the uh, pine tree, I'm also going to be putting in the texture of the shadowed areas. But by now the light is pretty much horizontal to the tree. So there's not going to be a really big heavy duty uh, shadow shapes in here. Uh, but I do want to make sure that I get the idea of the three-dimensionality of the tree. But again, you might be able to notice that I put in more rhythmic lines first. Not trying to nail it down absolutely, but get more of the flow of the shadow pattern over across the entire painting to try to hold it together. And then I'll even be continuing that into the underbrush on the ground plane. Bringing in a reference diagram so you can see how another artist has done it with the light that's a little bit more well, up higher in the sky. Perhaps you'll notice how the uh, larger pieces of the tree in that diagram uh, are grouped together and the lighting and the shape is a lot more organized rather than chaotic. I gotta admit those uh, darks I put on the underside of the uh, pine tree are a little bit too hardcore and a little bit too high contrast. So there's a slight bit of panic going on right now. But I also know with gouache, I can always go over the top of it and unify it later. So now I'm mixed up a little bit more white into that uh, orange I mixed before and putting highlights on top of the tree trying to show the light coming in from the right hand side. By just moving on and realizing that I would made mistakes what I can do is give myself some breathing room and some time to figure it out before I go plowing into it uh, with perhaps the uh, solutions to my problems. That's why it's important to uh, experiment as you're doing your painting and use those uh, critical thinking skills uh, to build up sort of an arsenal of problem solving devices so if one thing doesn't work then you can move on to the next one in a very fluid manner rather than panicking from uh, place to place on it because at least for me I'm panicking all the time when I do these things it's just organizing the panic and being able to go back uh, with different problem solving devices to make it work to tell you the truth at this point it's getting a little bit too spotty and a little bit too textural but I also know that Later on, I'm going to be pulling in the trunks and branches of both trees and the ground plane to be able to give it a little bit more sense of uh, overall rhythm and unity. The pillar of the trunks and the arms of the branches are going to provide a scaffolding to kind of hold up the rest of the tree and pull it all together visually. Mix together a yellow ochre and ultramarine blue, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to go right over the top of those dark areas with this really opaque, thicker paint so it lays on top and hopefully appears to look like it's more in the foreground and also add a little bit onto the foliage to give it a uh, more interesting shape. I put in that little delicate bush to the right to counterbalance that large grouping of pines on the left. Okay, now it's time to give those trees some support to be able to hold them up into the sky. What works for me when I paint branches is to study the character of the tree and see whether it's angular or rounded and synthesize it and then maybe pick out just one or two individual uh, branches that have really good characteristics to tell you what the whole tree's about. Because most of the time what you're doing is you're trying to get this rhythm and dance between painting uh, the branches in the front that are catching the light and the ones that are in the background in the shadow, uh, sometimes poking out uh, very dominantly on the front of the tree, sometimes even above the foliage so you give it a little bit more sense of uh, rhythm.
So here's a glimpse of my palette. From the left hand side you can see this the color of the trunk of the tree and the light and then what I do is it's light with a little bit of purple mix some orange in with it raw sienna and then raw sienna into some burnt umber and then mix blue into that which makes a really nice dark. One thought and technique I put into this is inevitably you're going to screw up as you're doing this stuff. You're not trying to make every branch perfect but you are trying to get them to flow together. So rather than painting very slowly uh, I'll move just from branch to branch over, sometimes dry brushing it. You can see some of the strokes are maybe a little bit darker. Speed of the brush is important because if you slow down, you'll get something that has a lot more of a thicker viscosity to it. If you move fast on it, will give it a dry brush and sometimes give it a lighter feel, especially as you move out towards the smaller branches at the end. Okay, time to shut up and paint a little bit here and try to get this thing all organized. Moving into the trunks of the trees, I put together a mixture of white, a uh, little bit of violet, and then uh, some orange on top of it, uh, just to kind of get the mixture there. Get a, give it a little bit of a warm uh, tinge to it, because I know it's a bit of an underpainting. And then what I'm going to be doing is uh, putting the texture of the tree over the top of it and extending it up more vertically into the crown and making it darker. It's important to remember that with a lot of this underpainting that uh, you don't get too attached to because most of the time you're going to obliterate about 80% of it after you get done. Right, at this point I'm going to change up brushes a little bit. Usually I use a flat uh, brush for this, but I moved over to a rigger brush, which is a thinner, more detailed one. Uh, just to get these smaller little branches that are here and then uh, be able to use it for that uh, dry brush that's coming off the branches a little bit more. Even pull together that thin little plant on the right hand side, the little reeds that are there. The important part is I don't want to get those branches too thick so they start to compete with the tree or compete even with the foliage on top of the tree. It's just sort of like a little after effect where you kind of show the branches are a little bit more brittle, uh, sometimes even disconnected. Uh, maybe the ones in the upper part are holding up the tree uh, as you can see on the left hand side and then some of these really beautiful like little oddball branches that are hang on uh, to different parts of it even laying in part of the trunk there at the bottom with one color. I do find that these staccato and these little curving lines along with the angular ones kind of hold it together and suggest stuff like shadows underneath bushes as you can see, a lot of the uh, strokes I put in for the branches start solid and end up sort of being dry brushed and, and bring out the rather chaotic organization of the tree. So inevitably, I beat the living tar out of the tree and always kind of fill it up a little bit more than it should. So I go back in and mix up that sky color back again, slightly lighter, and then come back in and reintroduce those uh, sky holes again. So as Edgar Payne used to say, the birds will be able to fly into your tree rather than hitting a wall. Then I go along the edges and make the edges a little bit more interesting too. Cut into them. Uh, that way you can see the character of the tree more. As I move over to the eucalyptus tree, you can see I really, really overstuffed it. And now again, I'm going back in and opening up those holes in the trees even using the color underneath, the wetness of it, uh, to give it not so much of a blocky feel, but uh, do a little bit of color mixing inadvertently. Okay, with a little bit of that last uh, painting going on in the crown of the trees, uh, I've come to the completion of it. I've tried my best to harmonize the shape, the color, uh, the textures, and the overall rhythm of the entire composition. Now let's finally pull out to the whole composition again, and you can see the editing choices I made. Uh, about color, about the rhythm of it, the shape, leaving some pieces of foliage out, accenting some other ones, trying to get the shadows right, the edges correctly, the lost and found edges. Sometimes it's very soft, sometimes it has more of a hard edge to it, but in general just trying to get it to work all as one composition as I said before. So before we finish I'd like to show you some paintings that I've done using the same techniques from uh, my travels around the world. Whether it's local, 
uh, sycamore trees or a graveyard over in England. Uh, There's beautiful little elm trees. The top one is from over in Kenya on safari. The bottom one is uh, in Rome. The big, wonderful cypress trees that just arch across the skyline in a storm. Uh, local gardens uh, over in the uh, forests of Belgium. And uh, even some uh, redwood trees over here on the right hand side. And I'd like to thank you a lot for viewing the video and take a look at it. There's other ones. There's my contact information and where you're able to see more work if you desire to. And I'd like to thank you a lot for joining this video and uh, feel free to take a look at the other ones. Thank you. Adios. Bye.